It's so taken a year to make and taken really. a year because we started demo a year, more than a year ago. It was November 90. Yeah. Those demos. But in real terms, it's probably taken less than six months to make. And uh, we've recorded two albums effectively in six months. Lyrically, there certainly isn't any kind of theme running through the record. It's uh, very diverse. It's everything from like poppy love songs to um, introspective songs about depression and loss. And the most immediate thing about it is that there is a lot more guitar playing on it. Um, mainly because Teddy's joined uh, and replaced a keyboard player who couldn't play guitar and he's actually a guitarist who can play keyboards. So the emphasis has shifted quite radically within the group. The most obvious d development on this record from anything we've done before, I suppose, would be the, the playing side of it. I think that the, the, actual, uh, the overall sound of the group is much more evident. It sounds like us on stage and it sounds maybe less, I don't know, kind of cultured, I suppose. A bit freer, a bit wilder, which is um, more like we are. <laughs> Where does it fit in, in the scheme of things? Uh, I don't think it does, I don't think any of the Cure albums really. Uh, pr probably there was a period of 17 seconds space and pornography that ran, they ran one after the other. Mm. And there was a kind of, I mean even at the time we were aware of it, looking back to what we'd just done and building on it. But I think really since they're heading the door, that notion of progression has, hasn't, it doesn't really exist, does it? It's, a song, if we did like Kyoto song, A Night Like This, if someone came up with it now, and we did it now, mm. The song itself, would, we'd still probably think it was a, a really good song, but we would do it utterly differently. We have a special relationship with him, I think, because he's very much like us. And treats. by virtue of the fact that he's worked on so many albums. Yeah. He's just got the same sense of humour as us, and we get along with him really well. I think it, he's, he's there much in the same way as Tim Pope's stood around, that he um, deals with us I mean, he, on a kind of social level. I think he, he's we, we continue working with him. I mean, he's really good technically at what he does, but the most important thing for us when we're in a studio all together is that we're going to get on. And we have tried working with a couple of different people in the past couple of years just, just to see what it feels like. And there's, there seems to be a lot more tension than is necessary. Whereas with Dave, we, he, sort of, he knows us so well, he can judge our moods almost as well as we can judge each other's moods. So he knows when to like, push someone or when to leave someone alone. And, and generally, the, the atmosphere in the control room is it's like based on that kind of like social in, interaction. Because musically and like, song-wise and structure-wise, we know what we want. We don't really need a producer to say, why don't you try going to E instead of A, boys? You know, because, um, if we can't think of that, 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 I mean, that's why we're there. That's basically what we're doing. I think groups who need a producer to like put them on the right path are basically lacking something. And he's, he's much more than just a producer. Uh, you get the feeling that he's a Nintendo master. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it'd be difficult to put these songs from the album into a live setting because I think we've considered how they'll be live. <coughs> it's the closest we ever got to sounding live on record in, in studio so far, so I don't think there's any problem with the transition. I think they'll work really well live, they'll just be bigger and louder. And longer. And brighter. Brighter. And faster. <laughs> <laughs> Hi was one of the very early demos, because it's one of Simon's ideas. And I think instantly, on the moment I heard it on the demo, I knew that it was like a really good song. It's just one of those songs that I, you don't really have to do much with it. It was just there, really, the tune was there and everything. And, and lyrically, it's just about the, really about stopping to think about what you've got rather than always wanting something more. So in a sense, it's almost um, the flip side to some of the songs where Lyrically, I'm sort of craving something, I was wanting something more.
will open is like we did that in one go, just in one take, the, the whole thing right through from beginning to to end. Very live sounding, quite aggressive sounding, but then the, the words have actually been, I've had the words to that for a couple of years now. But, um, I didn't know that they were going to go go with open. Difficulty explaining Friday I'm in mean, love like, actually. The, the notion of Friday night exists within, within the band. It's just like from the days when everyone but me worked. I mean, it's like as everyone works for me, Friday night is like the, it's the end of the working week, I think. And I was just using that as the idea that you might reach a point, you know, as much as you feel on a Friday night when you think, well, I'm going to forget all my worries and just enjoy myself. And it was that, and it was the uh, trying to capture that in a song. So it's pretty dumb, really, the, the lyric to it, but sort of effective and a naive kind of way. Yeah. I didn't think I'd be, be able to get away with it, actually, to be honest. When I first wrote that, I thought, how am I going to sing this? But we had a party in, in the studio, and I sang it, and it felt very natural. And it sounded good the next day, so it stayed. To the Deep Green Sea, that was one of the, the three songs, along with Friday I'm Enough, that um, the other one being End, um, that were actually written here in the studio. And I think that, that the, from the Edge of the Deep Green Sea was probably a turning point in the record, actually, like, from a playing yeah. point of view. And I think when we did that, we realised like what it sounded like and how um, good it sounded, I suppose, that we actually that made us go back and re record quite a few of the other songs. To introduce that, that kind of live thing. Every time we do this, I fall for love. Wave after wave after wave, it's all for love. It's all planned for this year, starts off <coughs> around England, 10 low key dates um, in smaller venues, then go off to America. And then we'll go down to Australia, which is uh, which involves two flights, which Rob and Simon have kindly agreed to do. So we can go and play Australia for the first time in eight years, and New Zealand. That will take a couple of weeks to go around there. We might fit in a summer concert in England before we go off to Europe for another two months, taking in like major countries in Europe and some of the eastern. Part. Yes, I think we're looking forward to um, touring. I think we're looking forward to the concerts. I don't know mm. so much about the tour, touring. Although, unfortunately, you can't do one without the other. It's a shame, really. It's a shame we just couldn't go up very high in a hot air balloon and wait for the world to spin round a bit and come back down. The concert side of it, I think everyone's really looking forward to. Actually going on stage and playing new songs and stuff. And playing to new audiences as well, like going to Australia and New Zealand. And we'll probably visit places, or even places that we've been to before. There'll be people there who've never seen us. And by the time we got to the end of the American tour, I did genuinely feel that um, we wouldn't ever go back. But gradually, you sort of—I uh, think—you forget the bad parts of touring and the, the pressure and the hysteria, and just start to remember the really good side of it, which is the concerts. It's, it's like if, if you if you've got a hangover and you say, oh, "I'm never going to drink again," it's it's, and then when you <laughs> feel so nice again, it's yeah, it's only like that. Because of the petition that was sent to us, our consciences were more than pricked, they were like hit with a sledgehammer. If I hadn't seen physical evidence that like tens of thousands of people you know, that were prepared to sign a petition and want us to go back there, I, I mean, just the idea of getting on a plane has taken, it's a big step for me and Simon really to get on a plane because it like breaks something I, I, that was, I promised to myself that I would never ever fly again.
Yeah. You don't even really bothered about fans bootlegging concerts. I think it's a good thing. It, it won't. If a fan bootlegs a, a concert, it, it's not going to stop them buying a Curio P. I mean, it's just like um, a token of, of the event where they've been. Yeah. If we played a really excellent concert somewhere, I'd be really pleased to find that there was a bootlegger yeah. with his reason and quality. Yeah. If, if it, quality enough to capture the Because atmosphere. it would be pretty, it would be impractical and, and, and pretty dull to record everything you did. Mm. And, to, and even like every tour you did and put together a live album and you'd very quickly get slagged off doing that, even by fans. So. The artwork's often interesting. Yeah, the song titles are often interesting <laughs> as well. Almost as interesting as some of the words that I sing on the bootleg. <laughs> We just get on with him, basically, and uh, he makes videos with us that are designed to be enjoyed, not really to be used as sales tools. And I, th I mean, in the past, we were very heavily criticised. I mean, like there are certain outlets for videos, um, you know, an obvious one being MTV, I suppose. And a lot of people would, wouldn't show the videos, the early videos that we made with Tim, because they thought they were too weird. It's really funny now that suddenly it's, he's become like this cult director, and uh, we always loved Tim Post videos, you know. And no one ever used to show them, but I suppose we, we didn't really care, and, and still don't, because I think they're, you know, they're worth something of themselves. They're like they, little they, films. Really. They stand by themselves. Generally, he just approaches it in much the same way as we do. He just like, wants a lot of good ideas in it and then figures out how to put all those ideas into a video. He doesn't ever think about what we're going to look like or whether we're going to sell records, which I suppose is sometimes quite frustrating when we prefer to look nicer than we do, but um, I don't know, he claims that that's very difficult. He's such a flatterer. I wish this year that we'll end the tour and the uh, general atmosphere and feeling in the band will be the same as it is now. If we can do that, that would be something really special. I wish everybody could be happy. <laughs> yeah, that is a wish. <clears throat> as happy as us. I wish the human race stopped trying to destroy itself and the planet. I mean, it sounds a real cliche, but it is a cliche, but uh, you know, that's how I feel. I wish I knew what I really wanted. I wish I could find that out in 1992. I wish I had an answer to that.